think, for today, right? Um, MySQL high availability or high availability options for MySQL. Um, I have to admit, I'm not Andrea. I'm not Andrea Chobotaro. Uh, she was supposed to do that talk, um, but um, she was not able to come, so uh, we changed and, and I came here today. My name is uh, Mario, Mario Beck. I'm from Berlin, so it took me just four hours to get here uh, by train. <clears throat> and I'm um, leading a group of, we are called sales consultants. No, um, I, I should pronounce differently. We are called sales consultants. Uh, some people have problems with the, with the name sales in our title. So um, actually, we are the technical side of, of our sales team. There are always sales people, but we are the technical side. So we are consulting customers in how to use MySQL technologies, what are the new stuff in, in MySQL, um, what kind of architecture would be right. Uh, you give us the problem, and we try to give the solution. Um, Andrea was a sales consultant, or is a sales consultant as well, so um, I think we can replace each other. And um, you hopefully don't notice the difference. So um, I want to talk a bit about how to do MySQL highly available. Um, this is probably the most interesting thing if you need a highly available architecture, how to do the database highly available, because everything else is mainly stateless, it's easy to replicate, um, but uh, for a database, this is a bit more complex. And there are different techniques to do that, some traditional ones, some new ones, some that are not yet used in, in, together with Joomla, um, and let's explore if this might be an option for the future as well. And I might have some references to the talk before, so that was quite interesting, uh, the NoSQL thing. So we will have some connection points in between. Some of the things I will tell you uh, are part of future features we bring in MySQL that we develop. And I, my company comes from a country where you get sued if you sell hot coffee. So we are very careful. <laughs> and uh, that's why th this basically says everything I tell you about the future might even be true. <laughs> So uh, some agenda, uh, some, some introduction, and then I want to talk about plain MySQL replication, like we have this for the past 250 years in MySQL, then failover solutions. Um, the one that is a bit special is MySQL cluster. You might not have heard of MySQL cluster, especially not with regard to Joomla. Uh, I'm not aware of any, any installations of that. Let's see. And, and then some, some, basics and getting started, links and so on. If you do have any questions in between, just ask. Should be no problem to, to deal with that. So general considerations at the beginning. If you need the database highly available, the first thing you should consider is what do I really need to achieve? Um, I meet a lot of clients that say high availability would be nice, and, but is this really a must-have or a nice-to-have feature? Um, if you're adding high availability, this always means you're adding complexity. You, you cannot avoid that. A simple MySQL instance is the easiest thing you can have for managing. Adding high availability will add complexity. Will it make more expensive or more complex to manage? Um, so is this required in your, in your environment to achieve your objectives? And what are your operational capabilities? So there are a lot of cool technologies that are interesting to to check and test and, and play with. Um, but if it's really an important thing for your organization, um, it's also very helpful to use a proven technology that you know how to deal with. If you already know Microsoft failover clusters, I don't know, then why not use that technology also for MySQL high availability, although there might be a cooler one. But um, to achieve high availability, Doing nothing fancy is a good approach. And yeah, there, there are always budgetary constraints. That's the bad thing of our world, I guess. Um, there would be so many cool solutions that just um, are not realistically from a budgetary perspective. Um, also, don't assume that you need five nines for every 
kind of application. Some things can live with um, less than um, five nines availability. It's okay if some parts of your service are not available for a few minutes, maybe. Other parts are very important to have full availability. Um, so it's really uh, interesting to see the, the different tiers or define different tiers. Where do I need highest uh, effort to achieve high availability and where a single instance might be enough? The technologies that we have are kind of sorted in, in that slide, so um, by the level of availability that you can achieve. This is a great simplification of the real world, um, but it's, it's a good introduction. So um, actually, the first dot that you don't see here, I will talk about that when I uh, talk about the basics at the end, is do proper operations. That's the first thing you need to do to achieve high availability. Monitor the instance. Make sure that you encounter problems before they create a downtime. That's the, the step number one to achieve high availability. Then the next one is that MySQL replication. A feature in MySQL forever, I don't know. Um, very long existing feature, although a lot of changes uh, in recent releases in, in replication. The next step would be Replication only copies data from one database instance to another database instance. So you have a copy that you can fail over in case of emergency. The next one is that you use replication but do an automatic failover. And this is something we can achieve with MySQL Fabric. And this is something I want to talk a little bit deeper about that uh, because MySQL Fabric is quite new. We announced that a year ago. And um, yeah, I just want to make you a little bit familiar with the idea of MySQL Fabric. These techniques are based on replication. Then we have two techniques um, based actually not on MySQL at all. It's just some failover mechanism that we use also for MySQL. You can use that for any kind of application. Uh, DRBD for, for um, storage replication and failover clusters on any kind of platform. And up to that point, everything was plain MySQL. You can use the regular MySQL. The last one, MySQL cluster is a special version of MySQL. That's a multi-node database where we automatically shard data over multiple nodes, and you can create uh, greater clusters with that with the highest possible availability, um, where a failover, of, uh, a failover when a node fails takes about a tenth of a second, which is really interesting, but it's not for free. Not for free, I, I don't mean money with that. Uh, it comes at some cost that you have to take, some limitations. The percentage is, is nice to compare different technologies, um, but don't think about the percentage alone. Uh, the percentage is only relevant if you say that percentage per time frame, per year or per decade. It's no problem to achieve five nines per decade. That gives you one downtime of probably a week, so that might be okay if everything is fine, um, but the thing you really want to consider is how much can an individual downtime be, the recovery time of objective. Is it okay if the service goes down and stays down for 30 seconds, for five minutes, for an hour, or do I need a recovery time objective of uh, one second only? So let's take a look at the technologies now. Replication, the first one. Who of you is familiar with MySQL replication? Who is not familiar with replication? One, two, okay. Um, yeah, that's, as I said, it's in MySQL for forever and most people already know it. Um, just in a, pre, uh, in a, in a few uh, brief uh, sentences, replication means you're connecting to a database and everything you do is done here in the table spaces, but also all statements maybe just row changes, but let's talk about uh, statements, are written to a protocol called the bin lock, the binary lock. And a different MySQL server connects to that server and reads the binary lock and executes the same statements again asynchronously later. Um, but by executing the same statements, you achieve the same state of data. And this is the idea behind replication, just executing the same statements again on different servers, and then you have a replica, a copy of your data on that. There are a lot more details to replication, like 
writing the statements here or writing row changes here, um, writing asynchronously. So you do the commit here, you change the table spaces, you confirm the commit to the application, and then you replicate to the slave. But what happens if you do, if you have a failover? You acknowledge the commit and then you have a failure here before it is transferred to the slave. So in, in that asynchronous replication, you lose some data when doing a failover to the slave. There's also a, a state called semi-synchronous replication. That means you do a commit. Um, data is written to the table space files, to the binary log. But before acknowledging that to the application, data is transferred to the slaves. And if the first slave acknowledges it has received the changes, then we commit to the application. So when you do a, have a failover, you know changes are on my slave already. They are not yet executed on the slave. They are only buffered in the so-called relay log file. That's the semi-synchronous replication that we introduced with MySQL 5.5. That's good to avoid data loss in failover scenarios. OK, an example, booking.com is a user of MySQL. They have, I don't know, thousands of MySQL instances running. And they do everything with replication. They replicate from everywhere to everywhere. They have some, uh, when you do replication, you do not have to replicate all of your data. You can replicate only some tables or some schemas. Uh, so you can replicate some of the base tables that you need in all your application instances. And some data is specific to the individual instances. Uh, you can create quite complex. Uh, structures with that. Some of the features that we added, I think, in, in all of the last releases, 5.1, 5.6, 5.5, and 5.6, we have changed a lot, or we have added a lot of features to replication. So some of the things we added with 5.6, our current production version of MySQL, is things, performance and scalability. OK, that's always nice. Uh, the big change is global transaction IDs. Um, that doesn't sound important, but it is important if you want to do automatic failover. Um, the old way of replication was that the slave knows who is my master server and knows the binary log file name and the position in that log file. And when you have a failover and you're failing over to a different master, and that slave has to reconfigure to that new master. There's a different binary log file name, and the, this server is at a different binary log file position. And it's a nightmare if you want to fail over a slave from one master to another master. And that was really only for the brave guys or for the crazy guys. With um, global transaction IDs, it's quite easy, because each transaction in your whole environment gets a unique ID. There's a unique server ID and then a, a counter. Uh, that identifies each, each transaction, and with that, it's quite easy to do the failover because you know exactly which transaction you already executed, and you just read the remaining transactions from the new master. It's just changing the host name, that's all. And with that, we added a lot of automation tools. So there are my, MySQL replication utilities that we added. Um, if, I don't know if you're familiar with the MySQL utilities. Uh, there are some to do failover or switch over. Switch over means you do this actively. You decide, I want to switch over to the master to one of the other servers. Uh, you can automatically set up replication, and all that stuff is available as, as tools. Anything I tell you is community stuff, so everything is available for free. Whenever I mention something that is not for free, I will tell you explicitly. Um, we added robustness, replication checksums, crash safety, and one feature that I like very much, although I have to admit I don't see that very often in reality. Uh, but still, I like it, so you have to listen to me now. Uh, this is time-delayed replication. Time-delayed replication means the slave receives the changes, but it does not apply the changes. It waits for x minutes before applying the changes. So you can define your master server. You have a slave that uh, applies all the changes immediately for doing failover. And you have another slave that has a delay of 30 minutes. And maybe another slave that has a delay of 24 hours. And the, the problem with normal replication is if you do a drop table, 
that replicates really fast to the slave. You have no chance. The table is dropped immediately on the slave as well. Um, but if you have another slave that is 30 minutes behind, you have still 30 minutes to recognize what you did and stop the replication. <laughs> find find the, the point in time where you, uh, where you had that drop table and roll forward to that point in time and then do your failover. So it's a great insurance to operation errors. And to be honest, people and processes are 80% of all the reasons why applications fail. And 20% is products. So really the hardware or whatever. So yeah. Ah. Perhaps like uh, do you want a situation of uh, execute one minute before that or yep. ten seconds before that? Do you need uh, one command to actually to dump that table or to well that uh, to get the data from that point in time? Okay. There, there is not a utility for that. That's a manual process. So if you encounter, you did a drop table, and uh, what did I do? Uh, you stop the replication. You find, you, you read the binary log file um, to find the drop table statement, and then you start the slave again up to that statement. But these are manual processes. There's no automation to yeah. that. Yeah. Some things, and this is the reason why I showed that um, safe harbor statement at the beginning, what we are developing in, in MySQL 5.7 right now. MySQL 5.7 is at a stage, it's, it's publicly available, you can download that, and it's currently a release candidate. So we had a series of development milestone releases where we published new features, what we want to add to MySQL 5.7. Now we are at a release candidate, so the feature set is quite stable, I guess. Um, Actually, I'd be happy if you if you test 5.7, report any issues you might might find, or give feedback. So we are really um, we rely on on our community to use these releases pre GA and and test and and play with that. Some of the features that we um, probably will see, I have to say probably that we will see in MySQL 5.7 is some more things with performance and scalability. One thing, multi-threaded slaves. So um, if you know replication, the slave in MySQL was a single-threaded process. So 1,000 processes or threads on the master side were writing data. Everything was replicated. And on the slave side, there was a single poor thread that had to execute all the changes as well. In, in some strange environments, that slave thread might lag behind. Uh, that's the problem if you have slaves lagging behind, obviously, for failover. Um, there is a 50% solution in MySQL 5.6 already, but the final solution will be in 5.7, multiple threads, so you can run 20 threads on your slave system to catch up with all the changes. Monitoring, we added a lot of the monitoring of replication to the performance schema. That's, um, in case you don't know performance schema, I really like to advertise that. Take a look. If you use MySQL 5.6, take a look at uh, Performance Schema. There is a, a ton of great things you can derive from that. W what are the indexes I don't use in my application that I might remove? What are the statements that are running on my systems? Um, which is the table that has most file I.O.? And so on and so on. And a lot of monitoring for replication are added, is added in MySQL 5.7. Um, dynamic things, online changes, OK. Um, yeah, some some things for the resiliency. I mentioned that semi-synchronous replication. Um, there was one instance where you might lose the last transaction in semi-synchronous replication up to MySQL 5.6. That will be solved in 5.7 finally. So again, a lot of development in the in the replication area of MySQL. Oh, uh, one important feature. Not sure if this is relevant in Joomla environments, but I want to mention it anyway. Um, Multi-source replication. So you can have a slave that has multiple masters for collecting data, for example, for 
doing a reporting database for from different areas, collecting data just for reporting or anything like that. So up to MySQL 5.6, each, each slave can only have one master. With 5.7, we can have multiple uh, masters per slave. A colleague just tested 50 slaves, uh, sorry, 50 masters replicating to one single master. Oh, I still have to get used to that. 50 masters replicating to one single slave. Yes. This one is a hot topic, MySQL group replication. All replication that I mentioned so far is asynchronous. Even the semi-synchronous in reality is asynchronous. So when you do the replication, it's in the relay log, but it's not yet executed when we commit to the application. That means if you read immediately after the commit from the slave, you might read old data. This is a solution where we um, add a, a plugin to the MySQL server, a replication plugin, that does a group replication. That means you can connect to any of these servers and do your statements and do a commit. And at the point in time you're committing, the data is transferred to all and is committed on all servers in my group. And only if they all confirm, yeah, we can commit that, then it's committed to the application. So it is, in fact, a multi-master environment for MySQL based on um, replication in InnoDB. Uh, today, that is a lapse release in MySQL. Um, lapse release means it's based on the release candidate, and we added one additional feature that's just developed. Actually, the lapse release came out in October last year. So. Um, it's not the regular release candidate, but if you go to labs.mysql.com, you can download uh, that version of MySQL. And that will be group replication, and that makes it quite easy for an application because you can connect to any of these servers. Actually, that's a bit of a sales pitch. You can connect to any. Um, you might encounter some, some deadlocks if, if you do changes on, on several nodes. Um, so there are still some tricks we need to consider with that. Um, but it's, uh, it's a very promising technology. Was there anything I wanted? No. Okay. Now to MySQL Fabric. MySQL Fabric is a framework. Have you heard of Fabric before? One, two, yeah, three. Okay. Um, Fabric is a framework to manage a farm of MySQL servers for whatever purpose, for different purposes. And it's extensible. We want to add more use cases in the future. So far, we have two. We are working on the third one. Uh, and the two we are um, offering today is high availability and sharding for scalability. Um, that's the, the full architecture view of MySQL Fabric as we have it today. The idea behind Fabric is I have my application, the gray box on the upper left, and that application uses one of these standard connectors. And these connectors are actually handling the connection to the MySQL server. And we want to empower the connectors so that they can decide which of the MySQL servers in my farm down here is the right one to connect to. So the connector gets the intelligence, the smartness, the knowledge to decide which server I want to connect to. So this is no longer part of your application. You need no failover in your application. You need no load balancing in front of that. Um, the connector is doing that. And of course, the farm down here can change its architecture. So this should be dynamic. And the connectors are configured from a so-called repository that's called the MySQL Fabric Controller. That's a separate process that is running, that is monitoring, and that you use for administering the MySQL fabric. So the let's ignore that box. Only use the left HA group first. We only use fabric for high availability now. Uh, you start your application, and you ask your connector to connect to MySQL. You are not connecting to an individual instance. You are now connecting to a MySQL fabric. So the connect string is a little bit different. And the connector uh, will talk to the fabric controller and 
ask for the architecture. What is the layout of my MySQL fabric? And then the connector knows these are the available servers, this is my master server, and these are my slave servers. And if I want to have a connection, it will connect me automatically to the master server. And if that master server fails, of course I get a broken connection in my application, I need to reconnect. But the connector knows, oh, we have a change in the architecture, this one failed, we did a failover, this one is the new master. And it will connect me automatically to the new master. I don't have to handle that in my application. That's the idea behind Fabric. So the connector knows the architecture. If the Fabric controller decides we need to fail over the master, uh, it will do that. And all the connectors will know who is the new master and can connect to that. All the read slaves that I have down here as well are re redefined or reconfigured to point to the new master. So complete automatic failover. That works really good. Yeah. 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 This is the public that know that there are other nodes and automatically configure. Underneath, it's still replication. So any write has to go to the master so far with one HA group. And so far as I ex have explained, uh, any connection will go to the master. So there is no scalability yet. I, I will talk about scalability in a minute. The next step that we can do with the fabric is that we do read scalability with these read slaves down here. So if the application tells to the connector, I have a read-only connection, I'm only reading data, I don't care, I, I don't want to write data, then the connector will automatically load balance the uh, connections to the read slaves in my HA group. The one thing I have to do is tell the connector I, I want a read-only connection. I'm fine with that. If I do not specify anything, the connector has to assume it's a right connection, so it will point me to the master. So there's no magic. It's the same as we did before, only the logic is in the connector. You don't have to deal with that yourself. So, so does the, the connector has to do uh, some kind of query analysis? Or, uh... No, exactly. This is the point. That's why you tell the connector I have a read-only connection. And then the connector knows I go to this one, this one, and that one. So it does not any kind of query analysis, which is actually quite hard if you do that. If you want to do that here, I was thinking it's quite easy. If, if the statement starts with select, it's read only. Uh, but it's not that easy. You might have transactions that are select, 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 and at the end you do some some write statement or the other way. So you have to remember, I, I had a insert statement and then select, so I have to do the select from the master as well. That's really quite complex. Actually, you would implement a MySQL server in the, in the connector to know whether it's write or reading. So you have to, if you want that read-write splitting, you have to define your, to your connection it's a read-only. I need a read-only connection. So that was high availability. And actually, that is quite easy to set up. If, if you like, I can give you a showcase later on and to just see me at the booth. Um, I, I do have an example for that. Um, setting up that architecture is quite easy. So you create an HA group, that's one statement to the MySQL fabric. Uh, you add the MySQL servers, that's one, two, three, four statements. And then you activate, the, uh, sorry, you promote one of the servers to be the master, third statement. And then you activate the failover detector. I forget that sometimes. And then the showcase is really ugly because it does not fail over automatically. So, um, Four steps you have to do, and then you have a fully running replication with automatic failover. That's all. That's really create group, add server, add server, add server, add server, promote group, activate group. That's it. I do not configure MySQL replication. It's done automatically. Fabric is doing that. And I do not reconfigure the replication. Fabric is doing that. If there is a failure, it will automatically reconfigure everything. So the next thing is scalability. Um, we, in the last talk, we heard about sharding already. This is what, what people do if that single master that has to deal with all the right statements is no longer able to scale. Um, people do some kind of sharding. So putting parts of the data into one 
database and the other rows in, the, in another database. The problem with sharding is your application has to know about sharding. It has to know about the sharding key. It has to know if I want to access customer data starting with A, I have to go to that database. If it's customer starting with P, I have to go to that database. And if you want to count the number of your customers, um, there's no way to do that in SQL directly because there's no full table scan over shards. You can do a full table scan here or count star here and you can do a count star here and then you have to sum up yourself. Maybe we find a solution to that as well. I personally have some ideas, but usually if I have an idea, there are some pitfalls on the way. Uh, but I know that we are working on that. Um, so, and that sharding, you want to avoid sharding as long as you can because it gives limitations. But if you um, already have decided you have to go with sharding, then Fabric can give you some big advantages. So you can do that sharding for individual tables. Each table is sharded. One shard is in that HA group. One shard is in that HA group. And in your application, you only define, I want to access that table, and this is the sharding key. And anything else is done automatically by the connector. So in that case, the connector will read the SQL statement and see, oh, there's a where subscriber number equals 10,000. And from that, the connector knows I have to go to that chart. I don't need to implement that logic by myself. And if I access customer number 20,000, I know I need to go to that chart. And I do have management statements as well in my SQL fabric. So I can, for example, split a shard automatically. If that shard really gets too big, I can split that and say, oh, customer numbers from 1,500 or 15,000 to 20,000 um, should be put in a separate chart and create a new HA group and move that data over here. That's done automatically. Data is migrated automatically, and all the connectors automatically know the new distribution scheme. And that makes life much easier with sharding. But still, sharding is not and never a transparent solution for your application. The one thing that is important, and this is really the bad news now. <laughs> Actually, this was the reason why we submitted that talk to the Joomla conference. Uh, but of course, you need a connector that is aware of Fabric, that is capable of running in, in a Fabric environment. And the connectors that we have today is Python, Java, .NET, and the labs version of the C connector. The one that is missing <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry for that. Actually, we thought we had PHP support, but when then um, uh, that's why we wanted to have a solution by now. Um, the the problem, the issue with PHP is you have short-living transactions or short-living con connections, not transaction connections. So the connector for each request is creating its own connection, a, a new connection. So for each connection, checking the MySQL fabric node, how is the distribution to find the right node to connect to, is quite expensive. And if that fabric node is not available, what should the connector do? This should not be a single point of failure. So the connector is caching that information. In case that fabric node is not available, we just do what we did last time. And uh, that works fine in Java environments because the connector lives forever. You boot the server, the connector starts, and it lives for the next 20 years. In PHP environments, this is not the case. The PHP connector starts fresh with every new request, so it has no cache. Um, it has to connect to the fabric and then Okay, you see, it's it's not yet a suitable uh, solution for PHP. But yeah. um, if, if it would be stored in something like Redis or uh, Netflix, then it's not depending on the language anymore. So, uh, yeah, but still, you would. Yeah, but it still is a central instance here. Yeah. That. If, if you have that in memcache, you, that memcache instance can fail, and you, you want to have that synchronously between all the instances. Um, one thing to solve that is this one will be highly available, uh, hopefully, in the next release. That's uh, one of the solutions. The other one is we need some kind of uh, 
persistence layer or caching option for the PHP connector so that it can really cache that information and not with every new start it has to go to uh, to the fabric controller or some kind of central store to retrieve that layout information. There will be a solution, um, just not now. Uh, actually, if you look in the documentation of Fabric for the PHP connector, it says we do not support high availability. The charting part, um, you can use that today already. But I personally think high availability is the more interesting option, um, especially if we think about applications like Joomla. So stay tuned, there will be a solution, but not at the minute. The Fabric framework, I, I already mentioned that, has the idea to offer different services. I mentioned two. We have that sharding, we have high availability. I did not mention the third one because that's in, in a kind of beta state, that's provisioning. So we have, we are working on, on some integration with OpenStack. That means uh, now Christmas is coming and I need more read slaves. I need more scalability on, on the read side. And I want to add more read slaves. I can do this in MySQL Fabric. I just add a read slave to that HA group. And MySQL Fabric will initiate the deployment of a machine, the deployment of an operating system, the deployment of, um, of the MySQL database. It will clone an existing slave server to that and then integ integrate that server into the load balancing for read slaves. That's the, the idea behind that integration with OpenStack. Today we um, only integrate with the Nova component, but the, uh, the next step is obviously to integrate with Trove, the database deployment of um, OpenStack. And I personally have no idea what we can see here as well, but no, I do have an idea. Um, for high availability, a different option. Today we have that replication as an option for for um, high availability in Fabric. What about that group replication where we have multiple masters and then Fabric will load balance between these individual masters and we use MySQL group replication as a component managed by uh, MySQL Fabric. Um, that is one of the ideas going forward with Fabric. So Fabric is the framework to manage a farm of MySQL servers, whether for high availability, for provisioning, for um, sharding or whatever. That was Fabric. Now the group of solutions that is really boring because they exist for 20 years, but they just work. And they are actually, if, if we talk about Joomla and I need that highly available, highly available, this is the easiest solution to go for. Doing a simple plain failover. You have an active server, you have a passive server and some kind of cluster framework, storing your database on some kind of shared storage, with one exception, I will talk about that, and then monitor and if something breaks on that machine, restart the service here. And there are 20 different frameworks to do that on any operating system platform you can think about. And what people don't like about that, this one is only passive. I'm afraid of touching that because I think I get the chart. <laughs> um, people don't like that passive server because it's just heating air, but any, everybody is running in virtualized environments today. I, I mean, who of you is not running in virtualized environments with the... Yeah, thanks for proving. <laughs> and then there is no longer some, some kind of passive air heating in here. You, you always have to have additional capacity if you want failover servers, um, but with uh, virtualization you can cope with that easily. So what kind of solutions do we have? Uh, one that is coming from, from Oracle directly, Oracle Clusterware. That's the cluster framework that we use for Oracle RUC. You can use that for other applications. You can also use that for MySQL. There's um, an, an agent monitoring MySQL, checking availability and doing failover to the other node. One important thing that's true for all of the solutions that I mentioned now. That server is writing InnoDB table space files on that server here, on, on that storage. Now this one is killed and you restart on that server. That means it's reading 
corrupt table space files because it was stopped in the middle of, of writing. This only works if that server can recover with that strange data here, with that corrupt files. This is no problem for InnoDB storage engine. This is a problem for most other storage engines, like MyESAM, for example. This one really only works if you are using InnoDB, pure InnoDB, which is not a problem. Uh, I highly recommend to use that anyway. But some, I, I know that some Joomla environments use full text search, for example. And full text search, um, at least um, up to two years ago, required the use of MyESAM. Only MyESAM storage engine was available, uh, was able to do full text search index, full text indexes. This has changed with MySQL, oh, with MySQL 5.6, I think. Yeah, 5.6. Uh, ah. Yeah, and, and then we claimed that we now have full text search. So I, I forgot if it was 5.5 or 5.6 actually because I'm thinking about 5.7 all, all day long. Uh, but to be on the safe side, starting with MySQL 5.6, we introduced full text indexes in InnoDB. Also with better features. Um, it, it's um, pow more powerful than the full text indexes in MySQL. So if you think about using full text indexes in MySQL, uh, please move that to InnoDB. Run that on InnoDB. And then you don't have problems with failover here and you avoid a ton of other problems when running my ESAM. Actually, there are. I, I do have one customer that still uses my ESAM for a technical reason. Um, we, we don't have a perfect solution for that currently, um, but nearly all use cases that were pro my ESAM in the past are now gone. Uh, InnoDB really has all the features that my ISAM ever had and much more like trash safety, um, higher performance uh, asset transaction and so on and so on. Okay, so clusterware. Uh, another one, virtualization. If you use Oracle virtual machine, you can use a template as a predefined machine with Oracle, uh, with MySQL and it's doing virtual machine failover. So that's an option as well, not only failing over the MySQL service, failing over the whole virtual machine and restarting that. Again, you need InnoDB so that the database is crash safe. You can do that with VMware as well or with uh, whatever, KVM. Uh, Windows, we do support the same architecture on Windows, Windows failover cluster. They are all the same. You install the service on both uh, sites. You have a shared storage. One is running, the other one is waiting for the master to, oh, for the active to die. There's no replication. This is all plain MySQL here. No replication, nothing. If you replicate, you can replicate to, to the outside for reporting or anything else. Solaris clustering, doing the same again. And this one is a bit special. Uh, let's spend 30 seconds on that one. Um, this is DRBD, Distributed Replicated Block Device. That's a layer on the Linux operating system. So this is available on Linux only. Uh, that sits um, between the um, file system and the block device. So, no, uh, between the block device and the, the physical. So whenever the operating system decides to write a block to the physical device, that block is not only written to the physical device, but also sent via IP network to a separate server and written to that local disk as well. So it's a software-based storage mirroring. And you can define that to be synchronous. So <clears throat> if the operating system wants to write a block, it gets the confirmation only if it's written on the other server as well. So in fact, you're creating two servers with two disks with identical content. You don't need a shared storage. It's a replacement for a shared storage. Uh, it's just a, it's a shared storage in software, something like that. No, no, no. That um, any file system will do that runs on on the standard block device. Yeah, any file system will do uh, because it's below the file system layer. What is not possible that uh, both servers access the same file system at the same time. That doesn't work. But who cares? You have an active server, and if this one dies, 
um, together with Corusync and Pacemaker, you will do the failover. The file system becomes available on that side. Um, and you start the MySQL instance over here. That's the, the way that MySQL did failover um, for the past really 15 years or 10 years at least. Um, you're using just plain servers with their local disk drive. Boring, but it works. And for high availability, you want it to work. OK, now the next one, which is not yet relevant for, for, for Joomla. I'm not aware of that, at least. Uh, but it might be. MySQL cluster is really a different version of MySQL. That's not MySQL. Actually, MySQL is the smallest part in MySQL cluster. MySQL cluster was a development of Ericsson. They developed that. They called it network database. And in 2003, I think, uh, MySQL AB acquired the whole development team and the product from Ericsson and created a storage engine to access that network database. And now that network database had an SQL interface. And that was the beginning of MySQL cluster. That's a database that scales beyond one node. So you can add multiple data nodes underneath, up to 48 data nodes, and your data is automatically sharded. You get linear scalability from that. Uh, I will give some examples. Um, it's Actually, that database is still today is used as the database in uh, a lot of telco environments. So if you do a phone call with a mobile phone, <clears throat> chances about 80% that your call is going through a MySQL cluster. Uh, most of the telco operators use MySQL cluster for their home location register databases, which is used in any call. <clears throat> MySQL cluster always used um, um, a special NDB API, that's a C++ API, to access the data on the data nodes. <clears throat> MySQL later added that SQL interface that converts SQL to NDB API. But in a way, you can claim, or you, you can say that MySQL cluster was one of the first NoSQL databases because it was a NoSQL interface. There's only a key value interface uh, via NDB API. It's an open source database. It's scalable over um, a group of nodes. It has all the features that you expect from a NoSQL database. Let's talk about cap theorem in a, in a second. There is a big change. It's open source. It's available for free as well, uh, same as MySQL. <coughs> Lots of people use that. Yeah, OK. That's the architecture. So here's the MySQL node. You connect to that MySQL node. You create a table, but not engine equals InnoDB. You define engine equals NDB, network database, so a different storage engine. And then data is not stored locally, but written down here into these eight data nodes in my cluster. Data is organized here automatically in so-called node groups. Two data nodes always form a node group. They have identical content. So if this one dies, this one will take over. And that's really a split of a second. But this one only has 25%. This group only has 25% of the data of each table. Each table is sharded automatically. So 25% of the rows are here, 25 here, 25 here, 25 here. So data is sharded automatically. The application on the top doesn't care. The application connects to the MySQL server. The MySQL server does care. The MySQL server uh, wants to send the uh, request to the right data node. If it does not determine the right data node, they will talk between each other and do that themselves. Yes? Uh, limitation of 48. Why 48? Down here. Probably because they have an ID and that ID is uh, n bits long and something like that. I, I give you some performance examples of, uh, of MySQL cluster and then you see that 48 should be enough for most of the cases where we use MySQL cluster. MySQL cluster is designed as an in-memory database. So all data down here is in memory of these servers. We do persist data on disk as well. If you shut down the cluster and bring down the cluster again, you have all your data available. But all data per se is in memory. We do have an option to bring non-indexed columns uh, to disk only and not keep it in, in RAM. Uh, but all index columns are in RAM on that MySQL cluster. 
And here are the other interfaces. I mentioned the C++ interface, talking the NDB API that will talk directly. So your application actually is, is a cluster node. Uh, we do have a Node.js interface that will convert directly to NDB API. We do have a memcached interface. So you are talking to a memcached instance, doing set get statements, as always, with memcached. Um, but there is a plug into the memcached and based on, on some policies that you can define, data is persisted on a MySQL cluster. So you do a set on the memcached and that will convert that to NDB API and persist data in the MySQL cluster down here. You can have um, some based on the key prefixes. Uh, you can have some key prefixes that are only cached in the memcached and some that are persisted to disk. And down here we have a relational model, so there are tables down here. We even have a way to um, split or to access with a key value protocol different tables and different columns down here. So your application talks key value, um, but underneath we have we can have just key value to, to column table, or we can have a full data model. And that same data, you can access that via SQL at the same time. It's just a different access node down up here. Uh, we do have a Java connector um, that is doing JPA. So your application talks JPA, and the connector decides, oh, that's a simple statement. I can convert that directly to any B API, or uh, this is a complex one. I have to create SQL, send that to the MySQL server, and then it's handled in my MySQL cluster. You can scale that cluster online, so it's, it's easy. On that layer, you just add more servers. These are stateless. So you can just add more MySQL servers. The whole cluster, including this and this layer, can have up to 256 nodes. Um, so having 48 here, you still have uh, 180 nodes up here. Who cares? And you can take any of these. And we can scale the data node layer as well. That's very interesting. So if we need more capacity in our cluster, either uh, compute capacity or, or storage capacity, just add a new node group or two node groups, and the data will be redistribu redistributed automatically. That's an online operation. So data, uh, e each da node group gives some rows to the new node groups, uh, and the sharding is automatically adapted in all the application nodes, so they know the new sharding scheme automatically. The one thing that is missing is this step, scaling down. So we are happy for Christmas, we can increase the capacity, and after Christmas we keep our fingers crossed that you just keep up the high business. <laughs> it's easy to scale down on that one. Um, you just remove nodes. Um, but it's not easy on that one. Failure. Uh, anything can fail in a MySQL cluster. Um, that does not mean it's not stable. <laughs> it means it's no problem if a node fails. Uh, you need one access node, and in each node group, you need one of the data nodes available. If both nodes of a node group fail, that means I'm uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's 16% of the rows are down here. I'm missing 16% of the rows of each table. And that means my data is no longer consistent. I cannot access the consistent full database. And my SQL cluster considers consistency higher than anything else. That's the cap theorem that we had in the talk before. Uh, or is it able to run in a partition mode? No, my SQL cluster says con um, consistency is higher than anything else. If I really lose both data nodes, I will shut down the whole cluster. Consistency is ranked higher than partition awareness. Um, of course, if you wait until you lose one node in each node group, um, that's not best practice. So you should be much quicker. That's why I said monitoring is really key in high availability environments. Okay, um, let's, yeah, um, we just announced the new version of 7.4. I will just give you some examples of performance. So this is a benchmark with the NoSQL interface, the NDB API. This one achieved with 32 nodes down here, you uh, achieved 200 million reads per second. 200 million, that's a lot. Um, it's only reads, that's easy. And 
that no SQL interface is only primary key access. That's a very simple interface. Let's say this is a key value store. Um, and the, the interesting thing, it's really linear scalability here because we have that simple primary key access. That's ideal for my SQL cluster. This one is more interesting. Um, that's a regular, uh, it's not a regular application, but it's a benchmark that mimics a regular application. Uh, that's the um, DBT2 benchmark that mimics uh, a warehouse operation. So we do have um, some disks that are um, disk-based only that have to be retrieved from disk. We do have join operations. We do have um, group operations, anything that SQL offers. And uh, on a cluster with 60 nodes, we achieve 2.5 million SQL statements per second. Anything. Group by, joins, simple inserts, simple selects, a real mix of applications. And this is what might be possible with Joomla as well. I don't know. I d actually, I, I'm not a uh, big connoisseur of, of Joomla, so I don't know what kind of queries Joomla really sends to the MySQL server. But um, I think it's, it's worth a try if we need that kind of scalability for a Joomla application. Let's skip that, um, um, that part. So when is MySQL cluster a good choice? When you need that right scalability? That's different than that read scale out we had with reg regular replication. Now we have right scalability. More nodes meet more right scale, more write capability. Um, we have much higher uptime requirements. So if you need an uptime of really five nines per week, maybe even, uh, MySQL cluster is the only solution that, that really can achieve that. And we have lots of interfaces, so SQL and different NoSQL interfaces that you can use as well. That makes it easier for developers uh, to work towards MySQL cluster, but also gives better performance. MySQL cluster is really designed for short transactions. You can run any kind of reporting on that, but don't expect MySQL cluster to perform very good. Um, it's not made for that. The shared nothing architecture is really ideal for short transactions on, on individual tables. You can do everything, so it's no problem if you have a mixture of everything, but don't use MySQL cluster for a reporting database. Um, there are two things about performance. One is latency and the other one is bandwidth or throughput. MySQL cluster, if you compare an InnoDB instance to a MySQL cluster, MySQL cluster will be slower if you compare a single statement. That's no wonder you have network communication all over the place in MySQL cluster. InnoDB has everything in buffer cache. Of course, that's faster. There's no way to be faster than retrieving data from a buffer cache. But once you need throughput, you need 2.5 million queries per second. Um, plain InnoDB will uh, it will die long before 2.5 million uh, statements per second. Uh, MySQL cluster is great at throughput. That's the key thing. If you have high throughput requirements, MySQL cluster is really the choice. And you have to be aware that's a different storage engine. There are some changes between InnoDB and, and NDB. Some things from the past are solved. Uh, if you heard about cluster before, uh, we, we said cluster does not support foreign keys, don't do join operations. These are all things of the past. So we do have customers running content management systems on MySQL cluster, um, and they have join operations of 11 tables, and we, we improved the performance of these operations in, in one of the last releases by a factor of 70. So this is really a thing of the past. Uh, but there are still differences, like number of columns. Uh, maximum column width is 14K not counting blobs and, and stuff like that. If you are interested in that, take a look at the MySQL cluster evaluation guide. That really goes into detail and gives uh, detailed steps how to check whether your application is a good fit for MySQL cluster or not. OK, the basics. You need some things around MySQL to make that run. This is what we sell as the Enterprise Edition. I don't care. I don't want to talk about what we are selling today, but all these tools are necessary to achieve high availability. If you use our tool, or I think our tools are really better than the others that are available, but you can use the others as well. Uh, I just want to give a brief outlook of that. One is monitoring. If you do replication, for example, you have to do monitoring. There's no, no sense in having a replication and not monitoring if that replication is working. That's not high availability. Monitoring is really the key. 
Online backup, that's a, a thing for availability as well. Um, first, you don't need to lock your system during backup, but even more important, the restore time. If you do MySQL dump, that's downtime if you have to restore your data. That's all downtime here, 1,200 minutes, uh, where enterprise backup took 40 minutes to restore that database. Because that's a physical copy and that's a logical copy, reading all that SQL, and physical copy is as fast as your storage. Uh, security. If you have a security problem, that will affect your high availability. And one of the things I'd like to mention here that's quite new, and, and just to make you aware of that, we added a MySQL Enterprise Firewall. That's a commercial add-on. That's only available in the commercial edition. Um, that protects you from SQL injection. So that statement will be accepted because it's in a whitelist, and that statement will be rejected, or one equals one. That's the default trick in SQL injection. Just add some stupid stuff so that you circumvent any kind of uh, where clause. And that one is blocked uh, by, the, by the firewall. You can record what statements are okay for your application, and then anything else will be blocked automatically. That's a great uh, way to avoid SQL injection in your MySQL database. Okay, support is good as well, yeah. That's an overview slide. Um, I, I will not go into detail. We did this in the last um, 59 minutes. Um, all the options from replication fabric uh, to failover solutions up to MySQL cluster and different features, that's much more relevant than saying this solution 99.5%, 99.9. This is really the relevance. It gives you the details. Do I have automatic failover? Do I have zero data loss? Uh, which platforms are supported, what is the clustering mode, active, passive, or whatever. Can I scale with that, and so on, and so on. Uh, all the slides are available on SlideShare as well, if you want to reference that. And I do have some, some more links for you with further readings. And with that, I'm open for questions. You, you have three seconds for questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Yep. So uh, we need to achieve uh, scoring. No, not fit over like the actual lot of people within the site and not bring it down to the SQL server. Uh, what's the best choice? Because okay. If they are, that's the first yes, but on a certain level. Uh, so master master, I didn't see master master application there. Uh, I, I know it's not ideal, but yeah. Um, scalability is is a problem if you don't have anything in the application. The one thing that will be coming that I mentioned, which is some kind of master master, is that group replication. Let me find that again. So this one is really master master. However, this gives you limited scalability. It gives scalability, but limited. Because every statement that is running here will be committed on all the servers. So adding more servers does not, does not really give you some kind of load balancing because they all have to do with all the commits. You save some, some time in executing the statement. This is done only on one server. And then the data changes are applied on all the servers. So that will be a solution to scalability for at least a factor of, I don't know, two maybe. Um, the next option that you can do today is really tune your individual, individual MySQL server. Um, try to increase that. That's the easiest way to achieve scalability um, on a single box. Horizontal scalability does not sound nice, um, but there is a lot of gain from that, and that's technically the uh, easiest way to, to achieve scalability. Really tune the individual server. There are millions of options. Um, the Joomla um, recommendation, I think, is still MySQL 5.1. That's not mine. So my recommendation is really MySQL 5.6 and, and use all the available options like SSD storage. Maybe at least for some of the data, you can take some of the table spaces out on SSD, um, use InnoDB file per table, and stuff like that. Um, that will give you uh, a lot more overhead and avoid that scalability problem for a lot of time. Um, and then I'm, I'm happy if somebody wants to try if MySQL cluster is a